Josh sent me a message and said, if I'm going to have Tom on again, <laughs> I need a little I've more. Got, I've Seriously. got to have you on to. We need some more beefcake <laughs> on this, on this episode. <laughs> Tom and I don't have enough, enough muscle mass to carry this on our own. <laughs> this is all just tight. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to Obsessed Show, a podcast that is designed to inspire, featuring some of the most creative people in the world. I'm your host, Josh Miles. This episode is sponsored by the new season of Wireframe from Adobe XD. If you're listening to Obsessed Show, there's a pretty great chance that you love design and technology too. So I think you're really going to dig Wireframe. It's a show about how UX can help technology fit our lives. You may remember when I interviewed Koi Vin, Senior Director of Design at Adobe a few years back. Well, Koi is one smart dude and he's the host of Wireframe. This season, Wireframe digs into how the pandemic has changed our habits and lives and how design intersects with those changes. I got a sneak peek into a few upcoming episodes and I loved how they were digging into real life design issues like why dad can't unmute himself on Zoom and how COVID-19 is changing how designers think and solve problems. Also, they're going to be featuring design leaders who have built UX and UI experiences for companies like Headspace, Patreon, Kickstarter, and more. So check it out. Search for Wireframe in your favorite podcast app. I'll link to it in the show notes at obsessedshow.com, as well as in today's episode notes in your favorite podcast player. Thanks again to Wireframe from Adobe XD for sponsoring today's episode. Let's talk about today's episode. Today on Obsessed Show, I'm chatting with the co-hosts of the Biz Buds podcast, Tom Ross and Mike Chanda. For those of you who are longtime listeners, Tom Ross may sound familiar because he is amongst the small number of guests who've been on the show more than once. In fact, today is episode number three for Mr. Ross, who's a coach and cheerleader for creatives and entrepreneurs, as well as the CEO of Design Cuts, an incredibly popular design inspiration site with digital resources for designers. He's also one of the hosts of the Honest Designers podcast, who we featured uh, just about two years ago on our list of best design podcasts. Today, we also have Mike Janda on the line, who's also co-host of Biz Buds podcast, but is also a coach and the author of Burn Your Portfolio and the Psychology of Graphic Design Pricing. So without further ado, please enjoy this conversation with Tom Ross and Mike Janda. Okay, kids, all the way from just outside of London and Salt Lake City, respectively. I'm chatting with the biz buds themselves, Tom Ross and Mike Janda. Gentlemen, welcome to Obsessed Show. Hey, what's Thanks, up, Josh? Josh, super glad to be here. I just want to compliment your podcast voice. I was Man. just thinking that. <laughs> it is, I was like, we need to work on our smooth tones. <laughs> I got to, we can have some smooth jazz playing in the background. It's so good. That's the most relaxed I've felt since the I pandemic know. hit. Exactly. <laughs> I don't know. Listening. I feel like I've heard Tom do some some really nice British accent stuff when he really puts his mind to it. I feel like he could. Everyone's my, my Tom, great VO. Tom will throw in his American accent. I tried my British accent once, and it was a complete failure. One of the funniest <laughs> things I've ever heard. Just it was just terrible. <laughs> it was incredible. <laughs> well, okay. So maybe more important to state than than the quality of my voice is that we are recording this at the end of June, 2020. This has been possibly the craziest year ever. So when we publish this in August, if anything else seems amiss, just give you some context of when this was recorded <laughs> yeah. in case we get murder hornets part two or something else <laughs> oh, man. crazy coming here soon. Sorry, Ben Affleck. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. So, I mean, before we jump in here, how, how are you guys doing with, with everything with quarantine? Tom, I've, I've not talked to anybody in the last few months who's in London. So I have no idea really how things are going there. Um, fill us yeah. in. How are you guys doing? I feel like as a country, we haven't handled it the best on a global scale. So our numbers have been pretty bad. We've been quite slow to um, unlock down, as they're calling it. So mm -hmm. I have a bunch of friends all over the world who are eating out at restaurants and doing all this stuff. All of that is still shut down for us. And so it's like supermarkets are open. They're just starting to open clothes shops and that kind of thing. Um, 
So it's it's been weird, man. Honestly, like I, I I've got a self enforced self care routine that I'm doing now because it mm-hmm. got to the point I wasn't leaving the the apartment for two weeks and I just started going stir crazy. Yeah. So so what are some of the things that you've done differently or done for that self care that you feel like have been the most impactful? Oh, I've got it in front of me actually. I got the nice. tab always open. So <laughs> got to, I've got to meditate for 10 minutes every day. I got to do some weights and resistance training every day. I got to go for a walk, drink two liters of water, leave my phone outside the bedroom. So I'm not staring at the news and social media before sleep and be in bed by 11 PM game changer. If I stick mm. to all of those things, I am so freaking happy this week compared to how I was a mm. week or two ago when I was like anxious and burned out. Like Oh, did we freeze Tom? <laughs> so it seems, oh, there he's back. He's back. All right. Welcome back, Tom. Yeah. Sorry. My, my internet, like given that I do live streams all day, I'm a podcaster. My internet has started dropping out for two seconds, three times a day, which is really, really helpful <laughs> oh, yeah. in this line of work. <laughs> so I'm hoping that was the third time already, but we'll, we'll, we'll find out. Yeah, <laughs> it is. The, yeah. This is the evening one. <laughs> awesome. So, uh, Mike, what's, uh, what, how are you handling things in Salt Lake? You know, um, I started the, the quarantine lockdown eating frozen tombstone pizzas every day, uh, (laughs) no workouts. It it was, I, I just like, I defaulted back to college survival style living. That's what I, that's what I went to. Uh, my (laughs) eight year old son got so sick of frozen pizzas that he was like, I just can't eat these anymore. And I was like, man, you're eight, you're an eight year old boy. You can't eat frozen pizzas already. You got a long life ahead, man. He's like, dad, can I have some vegetables? (laughs) That's what it it was. Uh, and then I was like, okay, I, I started, I went through, you know, the roller coaster that everybody goes through. It was really challenging for a long time. Um, super, super productive one moment and completely burned out and fatigued the next. I, my gym reopened about a month ago and that was a game changer for Mm -hmm. me uh, because I do like to work out and exercise and, and getting into the gym helps me. I was biking a lot during the the initial quarantine, but, and I was kind of miffed because it started in during ski season for me. And we live by the greatest skiing in the world. According to all the people who live in Utah, we love our skiing <laughs> it's dry powder, dry powder, snow. And they close like on no live four days after quarantine starts, all the resorts closed. Mm. And I was like, man, it was two months earlier than they usually close. And so I was kind of miffed by that ski season got cut short and kind of just went into this little, uh, frustration. Tom gave some great advice and this is what I've started to do because then we hit not just in the worldwide, we, we didn't hit just quarantine. Then we started with, um, black lives matter and things that were good substantiated protests that were valuable, but the news and the social media environment became so contentious Mm-hmm. so many opinions from one side to the next and, and so much negativity that I have been better the last probably two, two and a half weeks of just significantly reducing my input. Yeah. I'm not getting on Tom mentioned putting his phone away, um, uh, not in his room. So he's not consuming so much because it's, it's there's just so much negativity out there. Well, I, I think as well, uh, both of us, I believe, and a lot of my community have um, been self-professed empaths. And so when you're actively, you know, you can't help but empathize with other people and, and you try to do so because it's the right thing, it, it's, you know, enormously draining. And so, you know, I've been trying to support my community who've been mm-hmm. burning out, feeling anxious, feeling, you know, like cooped up throughout the pandemic, a lot of people out there are struggling. People have fears about job security and the economy, all this stuff going on. And yeah, you just feel emotionally depleted. And I think it creeps up on you as well. And any content I put out there talking to this, literally every single person is like, me too. (laughs) So it's like the whole world is just kind of drained at the minute, it seems. Yeah. I feel like it's that. Plus there's so much of like, this happening for the listeners, like where we can see each other on zoom calls or whatever that like, if you sat in a meeting and everyone stared at you for the entire hour, 
like in real life, <laughs> those would be sociopaths. Like, yeah. like it's not okay to just stare at somebody the entire time, but you're just yeah. staring at faces this whole time. And yeah. yeah, I mean, I think that's one of the weird things. So I'm sure we could go into that and spend the whole episode talking about COVID and quarantine life. But I do want to talk about your podcast and um, what's going on with the two of you guys professionally. And Tom, since we've had a chance to catch up with you a couple of times, um, Mike, I wanted to get like a little snippet of of your origin story, like how you found yourself into this world of design and coaching and marketing yeah. and podcasting. Uh, awesome. I started an agency back in 2002 and I went down this path of, of all in building an agency. We had great clients. We built a lot of money. We won a lot of awards and I was just so driven and ambitious in that, uh, industry for so long. I sold my agency in 2015. Now over the run of my agency, I started building systems and processes for my company. Um, how do we do all the things that we do? How do we execute on those for our clients? And that ended up turning into a book in 2013, my first book, Burn Your Portfolio. And that was my first taste of starting to do speaking engagements and things. And I started to really fall in love with this mentoring, supporting, uplifting creatives. I loved going to those kinds of events. I loved meeting other creatives. I loved sharing content and then having people come up to me afterwards saying, oh my gosh, that was so valuable to me. I needed that. I'm so glad I'm here and meeting people like that. And it just started to help me realize that this is something I love to do. And it's something that has value to other people. So when I sold my agency, I started to go down the path mentally of thinking, all right, I'm going to, I'm going to go for this. I'm going to, I'm going to do this full time. Can I build a business doing coaching and mentoring? Can I build mm -hmm. a business going and speaking, writing more books, releasing courses? Is this something that I could do in my life? And so about a year and a half ago now I decided, okay, I'm going to go for it. And I had left the agency I sold to uh, about a year before that. And I decided I'm going to go for this. And I wrote another book and, and I just did a course. And um, Tom and I started the podcast. I started building my Instagram channel. And it's all been validating to me because now as I spew my advice, there are people who actually say, wow, that's really valuable to me. And <laughs> shocked like any imposter syndrome minded creative, I'm sitting back thinking, Gosh, I'm so glad somebody actually wants to hear something from me. <laughs> this is such good validation. And then that just perpetuates more content and, and more drive to continue to share. And so I, I'm living the dream right now. Honestly, um, I get to do what I love the most uh, in this world. And that's this idea of helping and supporting, mentoring people. And I love you know, meeting people like you and being on a podcast like this. This is just, I, I love it. I love <laughs> Best it. job in the world, right? It's so great. So great. It's interesting how many parallels you and I have, Mike, maybe we'll have to connect on that here in a yeah. future date, but yeah. Tom, obviously you're no stranger to the podcasting world. Um, how did you and Mike hook up for biz buds? Mike slid in my DMS, um, cause he's a pretty <laughs> aggressive character like that. Yeah. And, um, this was, we, we started in a similar kind of time with our personal brands, I think. And so we were some of the early movers in this, you know, teach creatives marketing space, which has now exploded. And I think we had a degree of mutual respect. We liked each other's content. So when Mike reached out and said, did I want to jump on a video call and kind of mm -hmm. record some questions with him? I jumped to the chance and we did that. And <laughs> Mike's going to remember this. We can talk forever about this stuff. And I didn't realize he had a bunch of questions lined up. So the first question he asked me, we talked for like 25 minutes on uh -huh. and just speed talked in each other's faces really passionately. <laughs> and then, uh, he was like, I, you know, I've got like a bunch more here, right? <laughs> I think we, we, we could have talked for like three days. And yeah. so we went away from that, just feeling this synergy, feeling this, you know, good alignment of values and all that stuff. And then Mike reached out to me in DM and said, did I want to do a podcast? I had two podcasts at the time and I was not looking to add more stuff on my plate, but it was a classic moment of like, trust your gut. 
trust mm-hmm. your intuition. I just felt like it could be something. And to be honest, it's still really early days. Like I freaking love what we're doing with the podcast. Yeah. It's some of the work I'm most proud of in my career, but it's still very early, but I do predict it's really going to be something in the future. Um, and I'm glad I went with my gut because it's, it's just been an enormously fun project. So what do you guys see as the goal of this show and how does it kind of fit differently than your other, your other podcasts? You want to take this one, Mike? Yeah. So, you know, the goal, Tom and I are both big believers that what we see so much in the thought leader world is concept without implementation. Mm -hmm. So let's talk about a big, bold concept, but now how do you actually implement this into your business? What are the action items for your business? And at the heart of the BizBuds podcast is actionable content. It's, we're going to riff on the concept and make sure that you understand the concept, like scaling your business. We're going to talk, mm-hmm. we did, that was our last episode that just launched. And we talked about, okay, here's scaling your business. Here's some fundamental ideas around scaling your business. Now, here are 10 steps that you can do to actually scale your business. Here's a calculation you need to make. Here's a list you need to write. Here's a a paradigm shift you need to have in actionable takeaways. And one of the greatest things that we have happen as a result of our podcast is that people send us their notes. Sometimes they'll take a picture (laughs) yeah, and it's like a page full of notes. That's awesome. I love that. I I said, I love getting those. I love when, you know, somebody listens to our podcast and they're getting out a notebook (laughs) <laughs> to write down the action items. That's the type of podcast that we have um, that we want to share with people. And and not every podcast has to be that way because there are a lot of podcasts that are great that I want to lay in bed and have my headphones on and sit and listen to it. I don't want to write stuff down. So I'm always honored when somebody wants to take the time to write down the content that we're sharing. Uh, I think that's a big badge of honor for both Tom and I in that. Yeah, for sure. And if I can quickly add to that, Josh... Um, as Mike said, not every podcast has to be the same. So I love everything you do with your show, especially the silky smooth tones. Um, (laughs) and I've got a couple of podcasts still. So the honest designer show, my other show, that's more people say like, Oh, it's like having a bunch of friends in the room. And I just feel like I'm kind of part of the group Mm -hmm. and I laugh along and that kind of thing. It's more chatty with biz buds. Our intention from the start was we want to make each episode like a free course. Like we, we want to condense all the nuggets you would get from a three hour course into a 30 to 60 minute conversation. And so at the end of each episode, we actually do a summary where we're like, here's the actionable points we've just talked about and I'll go away and implement them. Like it it really is kind of that much just trying to give free value. And so, um, it's that with a bit of brotherly banter peppered in where Mm -hmm. Mike and I just bully each other mercilessly. (laughs) I bully Tom more than he bullies me, but it's because of his general fear in, <laughs> of me, I think. Is yeah, he's very probably, intimidating. Yeah. I mean, Josh, I think you would probably agree no one likes a bully, but Mike's happy to take that role. Yeah. <laughs> Somebody's got to be that person. <laughs> well, you've got the design cuts and he's the cut designer, right? So we... <laughs> so, <laughs> oh, nice. <laughs> yeah, now he stopped eating the frozen pizzas. He is. I, I did. <laughs> That's right. I, for the most part. The yeah. gym is clearly <laughs> open again. <laughs> yeah, it's open. <laughs> so coincidentally, where I started listening to biz buds was I, I jumped into the two part Instagram series. Mm. Um, And and one of the things that, um, I kind of figured we would dig in today was on personal brand and self-promotion and marketing yourself as a designer or creative. Um, and you guys kind of talked at length about, about carousel content and maybe, maybe everybody listening totally knows what we're talking about at this point, but, um, what is it about the carousel content Mike, that um, kind of s- struck a chord for you with your followers early on. And I know it kind of sparked a trend in lots of other <laughs> areas across this space as well. Yeah. Um, when I started doing the carousel content, uh, it it was super early on. There were, there were a few carousels, not carousel content channels, but a few carousels mm-hmm. out there. And I was in this experimentation phase. And I, I believe in this idea that marketing is experimentation, you've got to just play with, you got to be tweaking the dials all the time to try and figure out what is going to work, what's going to work. And so you, 
you start playing with ideas. And that's what I started to do with some of these carousels. I, I started by taking some of the chapters of Burn Your Portfolio and converting it into swipeable content on my channel. And it started to grow. It started to catch on and started to be interesting to people. And then that made me as a marketer say, okay, something's working here. I got to jump in and do some more and keep tweaking how I'm doing this. And then a lot of people started to emerge doing this. And, and what, what was built through a community of designers was the style of carousel posts that we have now, a title slide and a thank you slide at the end and eight informational slides in the flow. And it's such a super effective way to teach. And the limitation is what makes it so great that we have to figure out how do I distill this idea down to eight action slides. I got my title slide, my thank you slide, and eight action slides. How do I tell this story? How do I distill this idea down into that limited space? Limitation is is fosters creativity. And I've been amazed at how many people have made some just amazing carousel posts as a result of that, because it forces them to get their idea down into really something concrete uh, and distilled down. And it's super good for me for being a long winded person. I err on <laughs> the side of over explaining. Uh, it's been super good for me to force me into these, these smaller little gems of advice that you can share in there. Yeah. I feel like in before that, and maybe has continued on people will also frequently, you know, do the, the micro blog within their posts. So their yeah. description text is like scroll, scroll, scroll. So yep. instead of having to read through all the words that way, there's a more visual way of yeah. kind of communicating a similar story. Yeah. Well, it's quite immersive, isn't it? For the user being able totally. to swipe, swipe through. Yeah. And so Tom, this is obviously something that, that you've picked up on as well. And you guys have both grown your Instagram followings to, uh, I don't know, lots and lots <laughs> <laughs> here very quickly. Um, and of course, Instagram is not the only channel out there for creatives or marketers, designers uh, who want to grow and promote themselves. Where would you where would you put Instagram on the list? So if somebody's like, you know what, I'm doing really great work, but I'm, I'm really not promoting myself at all. Like, where would that fall on your list of maybe strategies that you would recommend? And if it's not the top, then where would you start? Um, you mind if I jump in, Mike? Yeah, so yeah. I think that one was for you. All right. Yeah. So with, um, with personal branding, it's always going to depend on what your intention is. So what kind of work are you doing? Who are you trying to reach? That will massively influence what platforms you're, you, you're going to use. But at a macro sense, I think there are some interesting shifts happening within the social media dynamics right now. So what we're seeing is there is an ongoing and perpetual decline in organic reach. People love to moan about this, right? Oh, the algorithm's killing me and mm -hmm. less people right. are seeing my posts. And so social media is still very prevalent, but there's definitely a few opportunities within that right now where the organic reach is somewhat stronger. So I think Instagram, if you know how to work it, um, you know, can still give you a lot of leverage and it certainly has and continues to do for Mike and I. Facebook groups, really, really good. Mike just launched one. I've had one uh, for my newsletter subscribers and they work super well. It's a, it's a kind of little private haven that you can control and really build a close knit community in there. And you're not being lost in such of a, a busy feed. You know, people can come out and come and hang out and chat and that kind of thing. LinkedIn is seeing tremendous organic reach right now. And that's because if someone interacts with your post in any way, if they like or, or comment on it, it shows up to all of their followers. So if there's someone who's a power user and they literally just leave a nice comment on your post, their tens or hundreds of thousands of followers are going to be exposed to your content. And that is the stuff dreams are made of when it comes to organic <laughs> right. reach, right? You know, Instagram doesn't really have that anymore. So definitely LinkedIn. And then there's emerging things like text marketing, which I'm going to be exploring this year where people, you know, they want to hear directly via text message. And what used to be quite difficult in terms of infrastructure is now quite possible because of services like community.com that I'm going to be exploring. And so a lot of marketers are using text-based marketing. Um, and I don't want to be late to jump on that bandwagon because invariably more and more people are going to do it over time. 
there's also a reversion back to email marketing because as people see the issues with organic reach, they're increasingly seeing that power in a platform that you own that isn't on a third-party social platform. It's an email list where you can talk directly to your audience. Um, so yeah, that, that's kind of a few areas where I think if you're trying to build an audience or build a personal brand, it's wise to explore them right now. Oh, and final one, podcasts. I love podcasts because you get <laughs> all of the attention. You know, yes, you might be in the gym or mowing your lawn or whatever, but you're not being lost in that feed where someone's swiping 100 miles an hour right. and it's impossible to get noticed. Right now, the people listening to us are listening to us. They're not listening to a hundred other people at once. Yeah. Right. It's that one medium that you could be mowing the lawn or washing the dishes or lifting weights, but you're still fully mm -hmm. engaged in, yeah. in that communication vehicle. Uh, like anything yeah, else that I you love add to that? Yeah. I do want to chime in on that because the original question is where does Instagram fit in this, in this pyramid of options? Yeah. And, and Tom did a great job of, there are a lot of pros and cons to every single platform from a creative person standpoint, from a designer standpoint, Instagram is wonderland, man. It's, it is the greatest creative outlet of all the channels because you can do a single post, you can do a photo post, you can do a carousel post, you can do a video in your feed, you can do an IGTV video, you can do a live stream, you can comment and um, interact with others, you can DM, you can make custom gifts that show up in your in your IG stories. <laughs> You've got stories just like Snapchat. It's not long. I, I saw somebody posted something that, that there's some kind of tiktok -y feature that's coming for Instagram as well, not surprisingly. Um, oh, and also they're starting to mimic uh, Zoom group calls where yes, you can have 50 people on a call. Exactly. That's coming soon, yeah. Rooms. So you look at that and you're like, my gosh, I can get all of this in one easy to use intuitive platform and build a community inside that. Oh, it's, it's a dream <laughs> come true for designers. And I just love for me, because most of my audience is in Instagram, I love exploring the creative ways to use these, this variety of features. It's just so, so fun. Yeah. And, and then you're backed by Facebook as well. So it's got, yeah. you know, all of the juice behind it that, yeah. that Zuckerberg cares to uh, direct that direction. Yeah. Um, maybe we shift gears a little bit and both of you are doing coaching. So um, maybe there are young designers out there who have never considered hiring a coach or thought about what they would need a coach for. Um, who do you guys see as good fits for needing coach or who's, who is an ideal person who's ready to consider coaching? You want me sure. to, I'll, I'll jump yeah, in. Yeah, Mike, you go first. Thing. Okay. So for me, I, I, um, undercharge the market for coaching. I undercharge my market value for coaching and it's intentional because I am targeting people who ordinarily wouldn't think that they could afford a business coach or creative coach uh, like me. I am fortunate to be able to work right now in my life for the fun and enjoyment and the giving back of it and not for chasing the dollar. I chased the dollar for a long time in my agency years and I'm working right now for the for the giving back and for the genuine, I'm, I want to help people. So I offer affordable coaching services for young designers that are freelancing full time or have a one, two, three, four, five person agency. I do have some clients that have like 10, 10 person agency. The people who are trying to level up to the next phase of their business. And what happens for me is I have people who are a solo freelancer and they save up some money over a couple months of time. And then they schedule a call and I work through all of their problems for them in that one call. And then two or three months more go by and then they schedule another one. Mm -hmm. But I have other people who are agencies with a few employees and they can afford more calls. And because my price point is such they, they schedule a call every single week. And I've become super good friends with some of these people because I'm in the throngs of their business as a result of my price point. So 
this is why I charge what I charge and um, who I target. I just want to be the guy on the other end of the phone that can help you solve your problems. And the reason I want to be that is because I never had that for me. I built my agency with no coach, no message boards, no Facebook mm. groups, mm. no Instagram channels, no <laughs> YouTube channels. Era. There was nothing back then. It was 2002 to 2000 eight or so was the height of my growth. And there was nothing to, yeah. to support other than reading a book and trying to figure out how does this concept apply to my business? That was all I had. And, and so it was a real, it was a struggle and I don't want people to struggle the way I did. I want to be the person to say, here's what I did when I was you 12 years ago or 15 years ago or whatever phase you're in. Tom, do you want to weigh in on that? Yeah, I've got a pretty similar approach to Mike's and I love how Mike operates with this stuff. There's nothing wrong with selling your services. And ironically, so for, for context, I really underpriced myself too, but that's because I'm thankful enough to run a successful business. So this is not my, my income. I actually only charge for this stuff to A, qualify the people who are genuinely mm -hmm. interested mm -hmm. and B, I reinvest all of it into my I've got three part-time people that help with my personal brand. So any coaching income, I just put back into them to make my life easier and help scale things. So, um, at this time I'm charging $50 a month, which is ridiculous for, um, group coaching. And ironically, I've coached people who are other coaches and help them charge a thousand dollars a month for group coaching. So that's when you know you're kind of doing yeah. it wrong. But but I love it because the truth is when I'm running my company, if any friends or friends of friends or family members start talking to me about online business, I just want to go and help them for free and sit down and have dinner with them and, and map out business plans. So it's a great honor and privilege for me to be able to do that every week. And just got such a fantastic group. It turns into like, you know, this group of close knit friends. It's like a group therapy session. And I freaking love it. And the truth is like, you know, what's the purpose of having a coach? I think it lets you shortcut quite a bit. I think it lets you work yeah. smarter. It can give you a, a supportive mentor when you need it. And people want all kinds of different things. A lot of people want clarity. They feel completely lost. There's people who have something, they have a business and they want to scale it. Like Mike talked about, there's people that just need confirmation. They want to check they're on the right path. So they want that kind of sounding board to bounce off of. And I like helping with all of those different things, but you know, the power of a coach is I jumped on a call with someone or they were part of a group call. I helped them restructure a gigantic deal they were putting through. And in a 10 minute chat, I made them $18,000 more profit. Mm, and that awesome. kind of stuff arises and that's just experience, right? I can't do that out, out the gate, but I can do that after 20 years of living and breathing this stuff. So that is my favorite thing of being a coach is when I run up to my fiance and say, that person that felt totally lost, they're crushing it now. They quit their job and they've gone full time. That's yeah. what gives me fulfillment. Like the money will come, you know, I'm sure in a decade's time, perhaps even that's my full-time gig and it's earning, you know, very lucrative amounts right now, as long as it can kind of just break even, I just freaking love helping people the same way Mike does. Yeah. That's really cool. Um, from your perspective on the coaching side, um, do you think that designers are naturally good leaders, business owners, CEOs, or is, do you feel like the coaching is kind of necessary to help them flex those muscles differently? Uh, I, I have something to say about this. I think, I think that that's somewhat of a leading question for me to say <laughs> that designers naturally are terrible at this stuff. That by nature, <laughs> by nature, designers are so bad at sales and business and analytics and the metrics of it and methodical structure. There's so many designers out there who are so creative and so talented in the creative design components, but they're terrible at those other things. And that um, is something that I feel like I feel like I'm a good designer, but I'm great at that stuff. Mm -hmm. And that's why I'm so passionate about sharing it because I did that well at my agency. That's why my agency grew and expanded and sold and all that because of this systematic way of doing things, this analytical approach. And I love to share that and break those things down for creative to say, okay, 
yes, you're good at design. I'm not going to teach you how to design. I'm going to teach you how to turn your design talent into a lucrative business for you. And uh, by nature, my opinion is most designers are just really terrible at it. Not because they, they aren't capable. I think tons of them are capable of doing it well, but so many of them don't even want to try because it's just not even fun for, for them. The business side of things isn't fun for a lot of creatives. I think you it's know maybe what? natural that we as designers love solving new problems. We love creative challenges. We love what's new, what's next. And, yeah. and as much as we love to talk about our design process, like following uh, following processes that are business processes, that just sounds like punishment. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. I mean, naturally until you, you realize the benefits of it and then yeah, you got to like, have some oh, paradigm shifts. That's why you do this. Yeah, exactly. There's some paradigm shifts that have to happen. I had it happen to me in the early years of, of running my agency. I had to have the paradigm shift that, oh my gosh, I feel just as creatively fulfilled by creating and ideating a, a perfect task list for this project. And I feel creatively fulfilled like that, just like I do designing a perfect logo. It's, it's creativity still. It's, you still got to push your brain power. It's just a little bit of a paradigm shift in the way that you view it uh, that has to change. Tom, you were going to jump in and say something in there. Yeah, I think you're spot on. I was going to say, I forget what it's called. There's a psychological principle where when you perceive yourself to be something, you're more likely to be it. Mm. And I think a lot of designers grow up with this notion of like the starving artist or I'm inherently meant to be bad mm -hmm. at the business side. And so it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. So I think that's certainly true. But we actually did a whole episode on BizBuds of the marriage of design and marketing. And it is my belief that when you combine those two things, it's like a superpower. It's amazing because guess what? I don't really like traditional business marketing people. I think most internet marketers are sleazy. They reduce people to numbers. They don't have a, a high amount of humanity behind what they do. And guess what? Designers, they're great at creating really beautiful companies and brands, compelling visuals. They're quite often kind and empathetic from my experience. And so the whole chat we had about that was when you combine the strengths of being a savvy business owner or marketer and the strengths of being a designer, and then you shed the weaknesses and insecurities of both, combining those strengths is where the magic really happens. And I think there's a few notable people in our industry. Whenever you look at like, you know, the Lauren Homs of the world and so on, where they're just incredible creative talents, but very savvy business people and they've developed their marketing acumen. When the two things come together, ah, oh, like fireworks happen. Mm -hmm. It's beautiful to see. Totally. So the, the other thing that both of you have done really well is build this community of creatives. Um, I'm sure we could have an entire conversation just around the importance of that. What do you think is, is one of the keys to, you know, if, if there are designers listening who are thinking, I want to start a blog or I want to start a podcast, I want to start an Instagram following, I want to start a Facebook group, you know, what's the key to big picture to building out one of these types of communities? Mine, uh, and not to get overly emotional, but mine all starts with a genuine love for connecting with these people. Mm -hmm. I, I, I love my audience. I have so many people that I've connected to and they've become super close friends and I genuinely love these people. And sometimes they'll, they'll send me a message and we hadn't chatted for a while and they'll send me a thing and say, I miss you. And I'm like, I miss you too. You know, when we have a few weeks of not uh, connecting, and I think it starts there. I think if you, if you reach out in a genuine way, if your intention is to genuinely connect human to human, build a real relationship, not an Instagram number, adding another number to mm -hmm. my followers, but a genuine real connection, that's where the magic of building a community happens. And Tom does this so well as well. And we both are super aligned on this and it all happens in the DMS. I mean, man, my DMs is my, that's my favorite place in my Instagram app. It's the DMs. And I look down my list and I love seeing my little 
unread messages and I scan down and see all the people that I'm so excited to read what their next message is. I'm just chatting with so many people around the world. And, I, and that's where the, the start of it happens for me. And that's my first recommendation is go into it, not about building a follower base of X number of people, go into it thinking, I'm going to build a community of new friends one by one, one relationship at a time. And if you go with that approach, you're going to build a tight knit community uh, of people who care about you because you care about them. Love it. So Tom, do you want to add to that? Before Tom jumps in, let me just give Tom some kudos because when Tom and I, <laughs> just to prep for his, his comments on this, Tom and I started chatting last year, last summer, maybe a little around this time. And I would look at his posts and he, he had at the time, you know, 10,000 followers or something, which is a lot of followers. And let's be honest, but it's not, nothing compared to what he has now. But I would look at his posts and he would get... 400 likes and 180 comments. And I would look at it and I would be like, Oh my gosh, how is this guy getting so many comments yeah. on with so such a small audience? How is he getting so many comments? And he still gets so many more comments than the average person with the same followership that he has his comments way outdo them because the audience that he has is so connected and so loves his content and, and has this real relationship with him. And I was, I was jealous of that last summer when I was first building my audience and super impressed by it. Okay, Tom, how did you do that? I'll change <laughs> now I'll the time over to you after giving you well, some that, kudos because you've done it as well as anybody on the platform. Well, that, that's incredibly kind of you, big guy. I appreciate it. And you're exactly the same. You're crushing that right now. And it really comes down to, to answer your question, Josh, one to one connection. Everyone always wants scalable. And I talk about this a lot. I think it's like shouting into a tornado. You know, the tornado represents the busy, frenetic nature of uh, social media. You know, no one has time in their day. Their feed is chock full of content. It's content overload. And so people just shout into this tornado and their message gets ripped away into the wind. And they're like, why does no one care? The ultimate shortcut to that and building community is you make a relationship with one person and then you do it with another person and another. And that's controllable. That's not algorithmic or anything like that. You control who you build relationship with on your terms and theirs. And it's just, it's so much more rewarding. You can go much deeper with those people. And if you want like an actionable tip, I, I did a lot of video messages and voice notes. Mm. And it's actually quicker when people think like, oh, I couldn't possibly do that. Like, you know, I type pretty quick, but me saying, oh, thank you so much. I appreciate you. Have an awesome weekend. I can say that quicker than I can dive it. Yeah, totally. But it, but it means so much more to people. So, um, yeah, Mike is spot on. I just think those one-on-one -on -one relationships, which often do happen, particularly in the DMs, they're so, so powerful and they become the true fans. They become the friendships and the relationships. And everyone needs to stop chasing that freaking follower account because it means nothing. And I knew that, you know, when I started my company, how I started my company was I made best friends with our first two, 300 customers. I responded to a customer support question, their problem became solved, but then we emailed for weeks and months afterwards about their kids and their dog and their hobbies. And we just mm -hmm. chatted as friends and I jumped on phone calls with them. That's how you build community. You care. Yeah, that's awesome. Well, guys, I know we are getting towards the top of the hour here. I want to before we go, I have to ask both of you the question I ask everybody, which is, uh, and Mike, we'll start with you. What do you find that you are most obsessed with right now? And this could be life, design, business, anything. What do you find that you are most obsessed with right now? Uh, man, uh, I am obsessed with so much stuff. Uh, <laughs> I, I, OCD, man, I, I am obsessive. And uh, you know what? The, the answer to this is the same answer I could have given for the last 20 years. I am obsessed with work ethic and ambition. And I'm, I am a dog with a bone and whatever bone I decide I'm going to chew on, I am going to gnaw it down until there's nothing left of it. And that, uh, for me, it's, there's always that bone and it's usually whatever work effort I'm 
doing at the time. And right now, I just launched a big freelance course uh, a few weeks ago, and I have two courses of the suite that are left, and I've committed to get those done in July. And so for me, I'm obsessed with finishing that, but I'm also trying to stay, get back active in Instagram because I took some time off of, of posting a lot on Instagram there's not enough time in the day for me to do all the stuff that I want to be doing. And it all revolves around this work. My wife asks me the question, why don't you take a break? What, why do you want to work? And I'm like, well, this is my break. I, it, I when I'm on a break, I want to go down and work in my office. I want to go build more content. I want to go and create more videos. I, this is what I want to do. My life is a break. I just spend it doing <laughs> this because I love it so much. So that's, that's my obsession. for sure. <laughs> Lot, lots more parallels there. Uh, <laughs> that's a great answer. Tom, you'll have to tell us what you're most obsessed with now, and then we'll have to go compare your other two answers and see, see if it differed. <laughs> um, it sounds really self-indulgent to be honest, but I, I think like fundamentally happiness I hope that's not a weird answer, but it's like... Man, that's a better answer than my it, answer. Yeah, keep going. <laughs> well, 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 it, well, it used to always be, you know, success. And that's definitely, wanna... a, that, that's definitely a part of it. But it's like, you know, I'm looking a lot at self-care right now, a lot, uh, a lot of balance, a lot of like... I just, I don't like it when people just complain they're miserable and do nothing about it and just keep on doing things the same way they always have. I'm constantly trying to question like, what am I all about? What do I really want out of life? What makes me happiest? What makes me most fulfilled? Where do I want to live? Like all of those things. And, you know, I'm, I'm aware of my privileges that I've got, you know, on the back of working super hard. I built a company that allows me to have more freedom in those decisions. But, uh, you know, that's kind of the ultimate thing in life, right? It's like your loved ones and your collective happiness and without sounding too woo woo, it's like, I try and treat that almost like a business where I'm very intentional about improving it and working on it. Yeah. Right. I'm changing my answer in light of Tom. <laughs> I am, I am really, I'm obsessed with world peace and harmony. That's what I'm, <laughs> I got you. Yeah. Just, he, <laughs> yeah for for everyone listening, not watching, he's wearing a sash right now um, <laughs> you know, and he looks beautiful. <laughs> Well, guys, before we let you go, um, let our listeners know where they can connect with each of you on the interwebs as well as find BizBuds. You can uh, find me at michaeljanda.com and you can follow me on any social platform at morejanda, most active on Instagram. That's where you'll get back. That's where I'll get back to you the fastest. And the BizBuds podcast on all of your favorite podcast channels, Apple, Spotify, Google Podcasts, and so forth is Bud's podcast. And we love our listeners and we really value the people that uh, tune in to our podcast. Awesome. And you can find me at I am not Michael Janda mm. uh, no, yes. not really. That's my I'm, website. I'm, <laughs> that's my website. <laughs> um, I, no, I'm uh, I'm at tomross.co. That's .co and Tom Ross Media on all social platforms. And then as Mike says, BizBuds, which is our weekly podcast where we basically just roast each other and try and do it in <laughs> at least an actionable format. <laughs> <laughs> well, gentlemen, it was great catching up with you, Tom. Great to see you again. It's so nice good to see you, Josh. On the show. Thank you. Thanks, Josh. So and fun. Thanks for being obsessed with design. Okay, kids, that's episode number 145 in the books. This episode is sponsored by the new season of Wireframe from Adobe XD. For all of today's show notes, head over to obsessedshow.com. And if you haven't already while you're there, add your email address to our newsletter. I'll update you on some of my favorite new episodes and some cool things I find in my daily obsessions. Of course, all the links are over at obsessedshow.com to all the places you can find this show, iTunes, Stitcher, iHeartRadio, SoundCloud, Google Play, and Spotify. So no matter where you find your podcasts, chances are you can listen to Obsessed Show from there. Just head over to obsessedshow.com. The Obsessed Show is produced by yours truly, Josh Miles. To have me speak or MC at your next event, head over to joshmiles.com to learn more. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next time.